Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, I would like to welcome you to the first Jülich lecture. In particular, I would of course like to welcome our today's speaker, Stephen Palowski. Welcome in Jülich, we are glad to have you here, it's an honor for us. But I would also like to welcome representatives and participants in the workshop that we held yesterday and today. They come from Intel company, they come from Partec, they come from other companies, and from the leading uh, supercomputer laboratories in Europe. Dear colleagues from Jülich, I welcome you as well. I'm happy to see many young faces here. The series of lectures is of course meant also to promote our younger generation. Before we uh, start with the lecture, I would like to say just a few words. Stephen Polowski is a Intel Senior Fellow and Chief Technology Officer there. He graduated from Oregon Institute of Technology and received his degrees, bachelor and master degree there. And now since uh, 25 years or even a little more, he stays with Intel. And one can frankly say that he has pioneered many of the innovative ideas from Intel and he stands for technology and for innovation, not only in the United States, but all over the world. Intel inside means a little bit Polowski inside, I could maybe even say. This time scale of about 25 years is also a very nice time scale for the Jülich supercomputing. Uh, we use the supercomputer as a user facility, as you know, to uh, attack the grand challenges in information technology, in energy, and in health research. And over the last two or three decades, we have developed from a starter laboratory to one of the leading laboratories in Europe and sometimes in the world. Today is Valentin's Day, one could say. Supercomputing and Jülich is a love for a lifetime. Thomas, <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> um, the Jülich lecture is uh, very special. It is uh, parallel to our uh, normal colloquium in English, and what is in particular so special, it is videotaped, so it will be available at iTunes, at the iTunes University. Over the last uh, three years, actually, there have been 300 million downloads from these lectures. So, Stephen, that is a lot of people that are going to see your lecture today, over the next years. When I prepared for this uh, little greeting words, I wanted to find a citation from you. And actually, when I gave your name in one of the search engines, I got 400,000 links out of it. Uh, but very quickly, I found a nice citation from, nice citation from three years ago. Then you said, never has my career been more exciting and challenging than it is right now. I hope, of course, that this sentence is time invariant and it is still valid today. And we look forward uh, that you share some of your excitement and maybe challenges that you see in your branch in the next hour. It actually, it was intimidating. I thought this was going to be just a small uh, social gathering and um, uh, get a chance to talk. And I walk in and they said, it's going to be on iTunes University. And I was thinking my mom would probably see it. And the first thing she's going to say is, boy, you're really getting fat. Um, <laughs> so uh, I hope you guys can do something with the, with the picture to smooth that out. Otherwise, I'm going to be in trouble. Actually, um, I have been at Intel. It'll be 30 years in June. And um, it's, as I said, it's been, as, as uh, Professor Schmidt said, it's been a wonderful career for me. Um, Intel has given uh, people like me the opportunity to do just about anything you want to do. Um, I've worked for the company for 30 years, but I probably had the same job no more than four years because it's so diverse. And essentially, if you're willing to take a risk, and you're willing to um, uh, challenge the unknown, they give you every opportunity to be able to do that. Um, yeah, I, I have been involved with the uh, evolution of the processor and the PC for a number of years. There have been a lot of great people at Intel that I've worked with. I used to joke with my wife that um, if girls like you would have dated guys like me in college a lot sooner, we probably would have made it a lot easier for you to use. This is really our opportunity to get back at you. Um, so. Uh, this is the most exciting time of my career. In fact, three years ago when it was quoted, it's even more so today. And it's because of what I'm going to talk about. And um, it's, it comes a point in time, I've got two boys that are just graduating from college. Um, one of them, and I tried to talk them out of going into engineering, uh, precisely for the dating the girls issue. Um, <laughs> and uh, 
they both went into engineering. My oldest son went into uh, electrical engineering and my youngest son in computer science. And I envy them because they're just starting their career. I've got hopefully another 20 years to go, but I wished I was starting over again because it's actually more exciting now than I think it was when I first started and then the industry was really pretty young. So uh, Exascale refers to um, the next generation of high performance computing. Um, uh, Thomas has probably talked about it a number of times. And 10 to the 18th operations per second now. Uh, uh, why it's important for Intel is, is there are some significant, we call them uh, they, they, they overcoming barriers, they're challenges. Um, I'll talk about what is happening, what's happening traditionally in the industry. Um, and, you know, you have supercomputers here that have followed that trend. Where we see, and it was interesting, Thomas just gave a talk, and he said, here are the, here are the opportunities, challenges, I guess, but here are the opportunities I see. And I was thinking, man, I must be smart, because he said exactly what I'm going to say in about an hour. Um, <laughs> but I think it's for the industry, and for those of us in the industry, is probably one of the most exciting times. Now, consistent with, uh, by the way, I really want one of these screens for my home. Um, uh, there's always a legal disclaimer on, on public presentations. So uh, years ago, when we were on this insatiable um, quest to improve the performance of the processor and the performance of the PC, and we pushed the frequencies to fairly high levels, I remember reading an article by one analyst who said, we don't need computing horsepower anymore. I mean, how much do you need to run PowerPoint or um, Outlook or something like that? And it was interesting because the high-performance computing community can't get enough processing. Um, you know, I deal with uh, agencies uh, in Europe, you know, government agencies in Europe, in the United States certainly, and all over the world. Their business needs and their, their mission needs uh, aren't satisfied, and we couldn't deliver enough computing horsepower for them today to be able to meet the needs of the growing, not only the security threats that are occurring, but just solving some of the social problems that, um, that we see going forward. So when we first started out with our vision, we were actually looking at Zeta scale. Um, which um, I just found out that the, uh, there's a, it's Mueller's law, Muir's law? Yeah, okay. Mueller's law. I thought it was Dongara's law. So there's a top 500 um, website that's managed by Jack Dongara through the University of Tennessee and the, the top 500 org. And it plots the supercomputing trends and it's a logarithmic scale. And essentially every 10 years, um, the uh, performance of the computers goes up by three orders of magnitude. And Muir's law is every, the, the relationship has always been, you get that three order of magnitude improvement in performance with only a 10x improvement or increase in terms of power. And so uh, by 2029, we believe that Zeta scale systems are gonna be available. So we kind of, outline, we kind of outlined a roadmap and we came to a really interesting observation. Uh, if we start looking at how processors are evolving and they're scaling, um, we measure energy. You know, we, 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 we actually do count the amount of energy that we execute uh, by, or we, we consume by executing instructions, by tracking the bits as they're moving actually through the chip, tracking what's happening within the memory array. And the inner, you, know, you think about it and you say, wow, 10 nanojoules, that's not a lot. But when you talk about an exascale system, the challenge that we've been given by the community is we're not going to have power envelopes that are going to be greater than 20 megawatts. And if that's the case, that's 20 picojoules per operation. And when you see where processors are today on the order of, um, in some cases, if you have to go over the fabric, they're, you know, an order of magnitude, almost three orders of magnitude worse. And so as we look at this, we said, okay, Let's assume we follow normal trends. CMOS scaling is seeing some stresses. I mean, the de device dimensions are getting smaller. We're still gonna be able to double the number of transistors. Certainly <laughs> believe that, at least through this next decade, and I certainly believe beyond. Um, how far, I don't know. But um, before Moore's Law, people equated it with, I not only got greater number of transistors so things were cheaper. Um, you know, the, 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 the example I use, how Moore's Law has been important in my life, the very first PC that um, we designed at Intel, I was on that team, the um, bill of materials, that's the cost of the parts that we used to build that, was $2,000. And the PC itself sold for $5,000. Nowadays, you can get um, a device that's probably four orders of magnitude more powerful for $500. 
off the shelf. The bill of materials is much less. That's all been the progression of Moore's law and being able to pack uh, more capability inside a device and taking advantage of that. But it also meant we got improvements in power because the difference between the transistor operation voltage and then the supply voltage was so much that even if we scaled it down, they still performed very well. And by packing the dimensions, we got an energy efficiency as well. Those are going to start to uh, not, we're not going to see the same changes that we have before. And I've got some uh, diagrams to show that. So anyway, we sat down and we plotted out and said, if you take the current top 10 machine, I think this was done, um, oh, I think this was actually done a year ago. There, uh, I, th I think if you take the current machine, the Fujitsu K machine, it would still come out to the same. But we were asked, well, why do we need to go do this kind of work? Why don't you just take the top machine and we'll buy a thousand of them? Okay. We said, it's pretty exp that's a pretty expensive power bill that you're going to have. And assuming, we kind of backed off a little bit from the, uh, the uh, compound aggregate improvement in terms of performance efficiency. And we said, well, let's just make a, a nice assumption like it's 18 to 20% per year. Those machines are going to be 150 megawatt machines. So we said, you have a choice. You can either wait an additional five to seven years when the technology will catch up and you'll be at 20 megawatts in that performance level. Or you can build a power plant in brand new data centers. Um, or you might want to invest in significant research to change not only how we do computing, uh, the, memory, the memory hierarchy, the, the storage ecosystem, the network, everything. Just look at it, soup, you know, what, we, what we, we call soup to nuts, ground up, take everything apart and put it together. And we were told, thank you very much, uh, we'll get back to you. And another company who's fairly prominent in the supercomputing industry, they never really shared this with me, but from some of the uh, discussions that I had, they actually went in and gave them the same message. And this was independent. So these are two separate companies that um, are focusing in this segment that said, hey, we've got an issue. So if you really want to have machines that are going to live within the power budget of your current data centers, we need to do some significant research. And so, you know, power is the key. So it's really performance, but it's really focusing on energy. And, you know, typically when I was, uh, when, uh, you know, started my work on the PC side, the processor was it, you know, it was the center of the universe. Um, that's a critical component of power consumption. It's about, when you take a standard high volume server that we present, we produce today, it's about 30, 30 to 32% of the power. Memory is huge. And memory is actually becoming a larger part of the power. And the big issue with memory is we believe that as DRAM chips scale beyond, or lower than the 17 nanometer process node, they're going to be much more difficult to be able to get the density that they've gotten today. The dielectrics are going to have to be more expensive. They may have to do more layering. So on a per bit basis, it's going to go up. And if you want more memory to solve the problems that you're looking at on these big data sets, we're going to have to pack more chips because you're just not going to get uh, that same level of scaling in memory. At least that's the belief. Now, engineers will do whatever they can to try to prove us wrong. Okay. And they'll, they'll come up with some creative solutions. But generally speaking, the progression we've seen in terms of the cost of memory on a per bit basis and the scaling is probably going to change. So in order to meet the bandwidth needs, we have to pack in more chips. And moving that data is a significant component of the power. So our focus is not only on the processor. We're really focusing on what the memory subsystem is going to look like. And then, of course, uh, with the transistor count increasing, we still have to push down the overall um, uh, reduction in terms of power on a, uh, you know, as I said, on a processor basis. But um, pin counts are going to go up. If uh, we can't push the memory uh, interface that fast we're gonna, and we have to make it wider, we're going to have to drive the pin counts of these packages. And currently, we're already at package limits. One other thing I should mention, um, a lot of people say, Intel, why are you interested in this exascale thing? You're doing really well in PCs, and and you know you're getting making components on the consumer side. And um, my boss actually asked me the same thing. In fact, he said, "Isn't there something better you should be doing?" And I said, "Well, probably so, but whatever we do to solve the problem here, we can waterfall down into the mainstream." And when you think about it, um, if we build a processor that can work in an exascale system, effectively the processor in your phone will have the same performance as roughly 180 Cray supercomputers in, in the circa 1985. That's a lot. 
and the amount of things that people will be able to do in terms of voice recognition and things like that. And said, you can, you can take that technology and waterfall it down to the mainstream. And then that was interesting. Okay, we see the problem because of the energy efficiency. So as I'd mentioned before, um, we, especially in the 90s when uh, the PC market really took off, we saw um, a tremendous explosion due to Moore's Law and due to the process scaling. Intel's maniacally focused on delivering um, transistor density and double the transistor density on the 18 to 24 month cadence. And it economically is the right model. Okay, you, you know, every once in a while people go do studies. Should it be longer, should it be shorter? That cadence is, actually works out economically for the industry as well as being able to deliver product to the marketplace. And transistor performance kept up. But as you can see in 2006, as the first petascale systems were coming out, transistor performance started to taper off. Now that doesn't mean that we can't push transistor performance higher, but when you do that, you do it at the expense of power. So when I, uh, I used to run microprocessor research at Intel, it was a great job. You know, it was fun doing microprocessor work. You wrote papers, if there were problems in the product. It seems like if there's ever a, product that ha a problem that happens in a product, it happens on Christmas Eve or your anniversary. Now, fortunately, my wife, it must have been traumatic. She forgot our anniversary, so I never had that problem. But Christmas Eve was always a challenge. Um, but in the labs, it was, you know, it, it was fairly, fairly uh, uh, easy. When I came back to the product group, um, that was the time when customers said, your socket power has grown too much. We're going to give you a limit, and you're going to have to make the innovations necessary in order to stay within that limit. And we've been on that trend ever since. So in the high-performance computing space, um, or even in the standard space, how do you get performance? You, when you push, we, there, there's two concepts in computer programming, single thread, the standard programs that I wrote, wrote when I was in college, which was a sim simple sequential program, and there really wasn't a lot of parallel activity. There was some probably, but there really wasn't a lot. And then there's uh, multi-thread. And so um, you can put a number of transistors in, in, in our process gen processor generations and other companies when they build their next generation processors. They add features and they add capabilities so that the previous generation program actually runs better on the new, on the new machine. The 386 was the, um, I worked on that program back in the mid 80s. Um, and the thing that was beautiful about that is, well, the bad thing was there was no 32-bit code because the software industry waits until hardware is available before they actually commit code and resources because they typically operate on a shoestring budget. And if we put out a piece of hardware and then change it six months later, in some cases, it's very difficult for them to be able to handle that. So it didn't run 16 or 32-bit code, but it ran the old 16-bit code really, really well. And as Microsoft and other companies were able to start bringing on 32-bit operating systems and applications, we still continued to have that, that trajectory, but we still had the legacy and the old codes ran on these machines, and they still do today. We make sure that codes that were written 25 or 30 years ago still run on the current generation machines because that's the promise we have when you buy one of those processors. But in order to get performance, we had to make a trade-off in terms of do you still put a lot of transistors in to improve single thread performance or do you take advantage of parallelism and try to move the software ecosystem to uh, become more threaded and to, th and to thread their applications. And again, like with the 32-bit code um, for the 386 from the 16-bit, you have to get hardware out there for the software ecosystem to start to come together. And traditionally, it's been a five to seven year cadence. So um, you get out a piece of hardware, five to seven years, the software ecosystem you know, tends to hit, hit a pretty good stride, maybe a little faster now. Now, the other thing, this bottom diagram is a demonstration of uh, 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 process voltage. Um, for electrical engineers, and I hope you guys are all here electrical engineers or computer engineers, or if you're not, I know a great school, my boys go there. Um, um, but uh, we, we, we live by a, an equation, um, FCV squared, power is equal to FCV squared, F being frequency, C being the dynamic capacitance, so the charge that has to be put on to get the device to change, and then V being the supply voltage. And so by changing the supply voltage, we get effectively, and by changing the supply voltage, uh, we get a quadratic benefit in terms of power efficiency. 
but it comes to the point now where the supply voltage and the turn on voltage of the transistor are getting close, so it doesn't switch turn on as fast as it used to. <coughs> and as we start to continue to push that supply voltage, um, you know, the performance of those devices is going to go down. Now, there, as I, I'll show you in a bit because of some of the research that we did, which was completely serendipitous, we'll actually use that to our effect. Now, one of the things that uh, Thomas will complain about, or the people that use his machines, is you're not delivering enough memory bandwidth. Um, my first, when I left microprocessor research and my first customer meeting when I was in the product group was with a supercomputer company. And they didn't even, well, they didn't even shake my hand. I walked in the room, they didn't shake my hand, they didn't want my business card, they said, we hate your multi-core strategy. And I said, by the way, my name's Steve Pulowski, it's very nice to meet you, and yours is. And they said, oh, we hate your multi-core strategy. And I said, why? And they said, it was beautiful when we had one core, and if we added, wanted to add a core, we bought a board that had memory and I.O., so everything scaled accordingly. You're adding cores, you're not improving the memory bandwidth. And as you can see over, this, over the years, especially in the upper right-hand corner, it's gotten worse. And it's not only us, it's the industry. When you put more performance in there, being able to get memory, that's expensive. Um, you want to buy commodity memory technologies. You would like to build what we would call boutique technologies, but that industry is struggling to stay profitable. There are very few companies, and if they, make a, if they take a risk bet and that risk bet doesn't work out, it could potentially be their company. So you want to use the, the commodity memory technologies. So about the only thing you can do is, hey, if you want more performance, you're going to have to increase the bandwidth, and that's in, or the, the width of the number of memories and the width of the channels, and that becomes, a, again, a, a problem with power. So the, you know, as we're pushing the cores higher and we're pushing the performance, we're going to continue doing that for some time. People ask me all the time, how many cores are you going to have in your part? Well, it really depends on the market. Technolo technologically speaking, by the time these systems come out, we'll be on a sub-10 nanometer process node. We could probably have 128 cores in here. Um, is that the right thing to do from a reliability perspective, or can I sell that in the standard high-volume marketplace? I don't know. But the technology will allow us to get there. But as we put more of those capabilities in, it's only going to put more stress on the memory bandwidth. And then reliability. Um, <clears throat> reliability is essentially the time between failure of a system. Um, I miss the good old days when uh, you only had you know, a few components and it was an exponential relationship. So you had infant mortality where things kind of you know, died early, and then meantime between failure of, you know, on the order of, it could be on the order of a few years. But because the systems that we're going to be building have potentially uh, 50,000 to 100,000 sockets, could possibly have up to a million processor cores, billions of threads, memory on the order of petabytes, multiple petabytes, and those are going to be a lot of chips, uh, storage subsystems. The failure rates of these machines could be on the order of about an hour, you know, when they, when they receive an error, consistent with what, you know, what they do today, which is, what, on the order, Thomas, of month, something like that in terms of... Fiscal. Right. So the applications don't necessarily need to comprehend the fact that a part of the machine just went down <laughs> as much as they will now, and the applications are going to have to be more resilient. We'll put whatever structures we can in the system to make sure that we can recover from those errors, but sometimes there's just nothing you can do. The devices are getting so small that an alpha strike from a particle that happens to be in the package, just a natural decaying radioactive isotope, will flip a bit. And if we don't have the ability to look at that and be able to have the right error correcting codes in there, then you know that's an error and you're going to have to go back to some point and restart. And at the time with these systems, when you see that crossover point, the worry is, is if we follow the standard model we do today, we'll be checkpointing more than we will actually be getting work done. So again, it's a challenge, and it's going to be a hardware and software challenge being able to um, focus on that. So <clears throat> in the past, uh, in my previous life, single thread performance uh, was the mainstay. If we could take old programs written by you know, college students and people like me, and they, they ran faster, that was great, and you burned frequency, you burned area, um, and you burned power in order to make sure that you got this maniacal improvement on performance. <laughs> and the cost, the constraints were really cost. Um, you know, when we go to uh, 
for these HPC systems, these chips are going to be roughly the size of what we call the reticle limit on the die. So when you look at a computer die, it's got regular stamps. It looks just like a, a you know maybe postage stamps that are on the die. And what's inside that reticle is essentially the die of the device. And you can have multiple die per reticle depending on that size, or you could have a full one die per that reticle, which in some of these high performance computing systems, that's what those chips will look like. So finance will give us a number and say, here's your die size, now figure out the kinds of things that you can actually put into that device. And so cost was always a constraint. It's still going to be a constraint, but as I mentioned before, energy is going to be the main focal point as well as um, programming productivity. Uh, as we've been doing a lot of this work, <clears throat> and I'll talk about what we've been doing in Europe, but certainly we've worked with the national labs in the U.S., and um, they made it very clear that their uh, scientists are scientists. They are not computer programmers. They don't want to buy another machine and have to learn how to deal with the architecture of the machine and tune their code. They want to get their code and actually do good science. In fact, I was really impressed with um, NASA when they built uh, the Columbia system, the first one back in, I think, the mid-2000s, 2004, 2005. And Walter Brooks, who was the, the, the manager there, he said he got Columbia built because they wanted to get the space shuttle, the U.S. space shuttle back in orbit. So they built the machine. He took one performance measurement for LINPAC, and then he said, now we're doing science. And that's all that machine. They never took another run, and that's all that machine was focused on was getting the shuttle back in orbit. So that's what they want. They want their, their physicists to actually do real science and do what they pay them for and not have to sit around. So... Lots of challenges, but the opportunities. <clears throat> when I was doing, the micro, doing microprocessor research, the head of Intel research at the time and I had this wonderful notion that if we actually ran the transistors at sub-threshold, meaning that the supply voltage was actually lower than the turn-on voltage of the device, that we could get extreme amounts of computing efficiency. Um, and it's, it's kind of nice when you, you run a lab because you actually have the budget. So I went to our head researcher for circuits and said, got this wonderful idea, I'd like you to do some research in subthreshold CMOS. He said, which he was known to do, I think that's a dumb idea, I'm not going to do it. And I said, I think it's a pretty good idea, you might want to think about it again. And he said, I think it's a really dumb idea. And I said, okay, I just cut your budget. Then it became a great idea. <laughs> So it's a standard management practice. It works every time. Right, Carl? <laughs> so, but what they did was he came back to me about three years later. So they went and they built the de devices and they tested them. And he came back and he said, I told you it was a dumb idea, but guess what? We actually found that the devices are their most efficient right around the threshold voltage. So that little peak you see on the right-hand side, the yellow line, we're operating those transistors down at the 1.2 to 1.1 volt area, and they're operating at 2 to 3 gigahertz, so they're fast, but their efficiency per computation isn't high. It's extremely high up around the threshold voltage. Now, what that means is we're probably not going to be running these devices at 400 gig or four, 2 to 3 gigahertz. We're probably going to have to be in the hundreds of megahertz range. So it's going to increase the parallelism that we'll have to drive, but... We believe that 10x improvement in efficiency that's there, 9.6, I'll round up. The 10x improvement of efficiency is something we can't pass up. So that was a chance of wonderful research. And, you know, 50% of the research that we did in the lab, I would say, technically failed because it probably never saw uh, product realization. But we learned so much from it, and this is one particular reason. So as we start focusing going forward, we're going to see, you know, companies like ourselves building devices like this. Now what that's going to do and why the labs here exist and we have the lab at Eulish is to start preparing the programmers for significant parallelism and the kinds of, uh, uh, the, the kinds of structures that this is actually going to start to uh, drive uh, in this scale of machines. Now the other thing is, is when we operate the transistors at that level, the failure rates actually go up too. So now the reliability is going to have to p make a big play. But we just can't pass up that 10x uh, improvement uh, in power efficiency. It's just almost impossible for us to do it. Now, the other issue is, as I'd mentioned before, memory. Um, memory is getting, it's going to be, I believe it's going to be more expensive. The DRAM vendors will still be able to produce it, but it will get more costly. And in order for us to improve the bandwidth and to improve the density, um, we are 
probably going to have to come up with different kinds of technologies. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the marketplace in looking at the, some of the new non-volatile memories that are beyond NAND. Uh, there's phase change memory, there's spin torque transfer memory. These are uh, devices or materials that have the ability to have the cost per bit structure of a NAND device, which is much less than it is for memory. In some cases, some people have given me one-tenth the cost per bit. I don't know if I believe that, but it's much, much cheaper. Um, and it has the relative performance of DRAM, but it's got some of the nuances of non-volatile memory. You can't write it as many times before it fails. So you, when you buy your PC and it says it's got a solid state drive, there are algorithms in there that manage how many times a particular bit's written, because you can only write it 100,000 times before the device fails. And it moves the data around that disk, unbeknownst to you, it's wear leveling, in order to be able to get the reliability that people expect for disks. Memory's gonna have to do the same thing. Um, gonna have to have much more significant and sufficient error correcting codes, because DRAM rough virtually lasts forever. However, with that technology, it will scale beyond the 17 nanometer process node, we believe. Got a lot of work to do to prove that. Um, <clears throat> and we can get the cost per bit down, so we can get the capacity, we can get the density, and now it's a matter of how do we, what do we do about the power. The beauty about non-volatile memory is when you're not reading it, you're not consuming any energy. However, it takes more energy to write a bit than it does for writing a DRAM bit, so we have to play those kind of games. Now, the other thing that I'd mentioned was um, we have to minimize data movement, and this is where applications programmers come in, and it's really important. Every time we move a bit just from the internal caches into the core, we consume 10 picojoules of energy, and if we only get 20 per operation, <clears throat> that's not a whole lot of energy that we can afford to waste. So getting the applications to be more data locality aware so that we're not moving information around is going to be extremely vital going forward. And then we've got some idea for uh, packaging solutions. Now, memory technology, at least DRAM technology, hasn't changed in the 29.7 years I've been in the industry. It's gotten faster, but it's essentially the same basic architecture. When you go read, it lights up this big bank of, of sense amplifiers, brings in a lot of data, and you may use half of it and throw the rest of it away. If you use half, that's actually lucky. So, you know, one of the things we need to do is, hey, if you're going to access data, you want to access it on a small, a small block of data. You don't want to bring in a whole page, potentially four kilobits worth of memory, not to be able to use it. Now, that means changing the architecture, and that makes the architecture um, a little more complex, and it also brings in some re reliability issues as well. But the industry is willing to at least look at that in order to be able to... Um, get us the most efficient uh, solutions as possible. I also believe that we're going to see more and more <clears throat> uh, devices stacked in the third dimension. If we can put memory, I'll say, we t traditionally people say, well, why don't you put memory on top of the CPU? Well, that would be nice, but silicon is a very poor heat conductor, and those CPUs get hot. In fact, we used to have, you know, in some of the high-end CPUs where we used to run them in, in pretty hot, we used to have a hardware mechanism that when it detected a thermal failure, because we have thermal diodes around the part to make sure that we check to see that the temperatures are at the right, uh, right amount. And normally you'd tell the operating system, oh, there's a thermal failure, do something about it. And it would schedule a procedure call and maybe get to it. Well, um, <clears throat> we used to find that um, if we didn't have a hardware mechanism to say thermal failure shut down immediately, the silicon would melt before the operating system actually had a chance to get around to it. So we don't typically like to stack things on top of the CPU except heat exchangers that we can get the heat out of the die. But potentially maybe we can put the CPU on top of the silicon and there are new materials of being able to put between the die to extract the heat out and bring the heat out. Now the beauty of this is if we can stack the CPU and the memory together, we can reduce the I.O. power significantly. And we can increase the bandwidth because now we're not paying for a really expensive package with a lot of pins. We can take advantage of having vias inside the parts. Um, companies are working on this. Uh, it's a difficult proposition from a memory company's point of view, at least in my opinion, because you, if you want to make money and you want to sell it to just about everybody that builds CPUs, they all have to have the same via pattern on their part. And I don't know if that's ever going to happen. But that's the strategy I think we're going to see going forward. One of the things we did in the lab, um, kind of put a hold on that, but it may come back, 
is that we actually looked at the processor itself and partitioned it and just did a little research exercise. Never built a chip, but we used our, uh, our performance simulators and our, um, our power simulators and found that we could actually reduce the uh, power by 35% if we could stack portions of the CPU. So if we partitioned it and put it on top of each other and relayed it out, we could potentially save a lot of power there. So in terms of the, and, and when people ask me, well, what happens when transistors don't get smaller? We'll grow up, we'll stack them, we'll divide the die, we'll do whatever we need to do. That's why I say from the user's point of view, they're still gonna see that increase in transistors, whether it's in the XY dimension or it's in the XYZ. You know, that's, that's what's the beauty of this time in my life because engineers, give an engineer a problem, I'm convinced they'll come up with something creative. It may not be cost effective, um, It'll probably work, um, but they'll do something really creative. And, you know, and especially if it doesn't work um, or if it's a real impossible problem, I've never seen one not come up with a solution that you eventually uh, come up with. So um, I mentioned programming, I'll, I'll talk to it again. Uh, we need to make tools that uh, make the machines easy to run. Uh, one particular area is, is that uh, DARPA, the Defense Research Agency in the US, commissioned a study on um, ultra high performance computing, which kind of was the precursor. A lot of the ideas we got from Exascale, we actually uh, got from DARPA because you know most of the critical thinkers in the high performance computing industry in the US were actually part of that program and commission in that study. One of the things that uh, we believe is, it's just gonna be impossible for the programmer to manage the system in terms of not only the scope and the complexity, but if you have part of the system going down and having to remap your application, it's gonna be almost difficult. So these machines are gonna to have to have the tools and the run times and the capability so that what we believe, now this is my belief, okay? What I think the programmer is gonna see is basically a programming interface, a hardware programming interface, and then we're gonna hide everything underneath, whether it's a runtime, but we're gonna hide the nuances of the machine underneath. <coughs> so the programmer writes that interface, and then whether we have a thousand sockets, 10,000 sockets, 100,000 sockets, the machine will dictate how they can potentially use those, how those codes can use the efficiency of the machine. Now that's a nirvana, people have been researching that for years, I've been told I'm stupid for even thinking about it, but I do believe we're gonna to have to get machines that are self-aware. They're not only gonna to have to, and they're gonna to have to be smart in the sense of, gee, if I'm doing computation, shut down the network. I'm not doing any transfers. I can use its energy, steal its energy, and able to do the computation. And then when it's time for me to be able to ship information, I'll shut down the course and then let the network, uh, the network interface chip um, uh, you know, do, use that energy for that as a particular example. Um, so energy management is gonna be key. And traditionally in the PC environment, that's always been, excuse me, handled by the operating system, okay? And in fact, when we said, hey, we're gonna have hardware do that, the operating system vendors said, no, that is our traditional role. But as we're getting more and more to the point where we would inundate the operating system with the kinds of events that are happening on these machines to be able to manage power and to manage errors, it's getting to the point where the machines are gonna have some level of sophistication. So um, when we talk about our contribution to Exascale, we Intel, we of course wanna build chips. We want to continue building chips. We want to advance the state of computing. Uh, we want to make computing ubiquitous and take whatever technologies we have and get it into mainstream livelihood, whether it happens to be in healthcare, whether it happens to be in uh, uh, you know, financial services, whether it happens to be in security, um, helping farmers in, in poor countries, getting that technology out to the world. That's our vision and being able to enhance the lives. And so um, creating research opportunities. I'll talk a little bit about the labs here in a second. Um, new technologies and architectures. Uh, it'll still run x86 code, but like the current processors today are nothing like the processors that Intel shipped when I started, even though we run the same code. Instructions come in and the front end completely abstracts the machine underneath. I wouldn't know it if I happened, had to pull off the lid, um, but it still runs the same code. So those architectures, as far as the program is concerned, sees the same thing, but they're completely different. Uh, unified programming models I'd mentioned. I do believe, and I'm always asked this question, do you believe in heterogeneity and, and accelerators? Absolutely, as long as they're unified under one programming model. So if, I have a, if somebody has some application <clears throat> and I can do it more efficiently on a piece of reconfigurable logic that's inside the CPU, 
as long as we can unify it in the memory space, that instruction says, go off over here, we can use that potential piece of hardware. And we've got a lot of work going on there. And then, of course, economics. It has to be cheap. <laughs> so the interesting thing is um, in uh, supercomputing, I think it was 2008, it was when we were in Reno. Uh, I was actually, it was, it was by uh, the people from Gen C and CEA. And they said, uh, we want to collaborate with... Um, Intel for next generation high performance computing because we believe that it's getting so expensive and so difficult for companies to take this on, especially if you don't own the process technology because now the process technology and the components are going to be, and the component designs are going to be so in integrated, you're, you're not going to be able to tell the engineers apart. And the one thing that I learned from that is um, what you want to find is not necessarily an area where they can do high performance computing, but that one person that you know is going to drive this because a program like this is going to take 10 years. Hopefully not 15, but 10 years. Um, and um, politicians are going to come and politicians are going to go. In the US, when we, when we were doing radio work for Software Defined Radio, we were trying to work with the Federal Communications Commission in the US to uh, be able to come up with a way of uh, introducing new code and then having it certified so it doesn't violate the radio spectrum. And we came to a, uh, we got a term we called mean time between administrations because we were working with one administration and a new guy came in and said, I don't like that, and we had to start all over again. So um, politicians will come and go, but people that are really committed to the cause will be around for a long time. So we started the lab in France. Uh, the CEO of IMEC in Belgium uh, which we partner with, said that he was interested in developing a larger collaboration around high-performance computing, so we started that lab. And then um, we said, hey, who are some of the other key thought leaders in, um, in, the, uh, in Europe that we can help drive this exascale initiative in terms of understanding the applications so that the applications developers can help us inform what these machines are going to look like? Two names came up, Thomas and Matteo Valero in Barcelona. And so we went to them and said, hey, we've set up these consortia lab, we would like to do the same with you, where we potentially can put engineers and resources, collaborate with your engineers and resources, and we help develop the next generation of applications that'll run on these machines, and you'll actually help us decide and architect those machines. Um, and it's a pretty bold concept because in Europe is the first place we've done that. We've established relationships with the national labs in the U.S., but we haven't had any formal relationships like we have here in Europe. So um, we started them as co-design centers in 2011. And as I said, I wanted to find that one person that is committed. And we know they're going to drive it. They're the ones that are, when there's money up for a new machine, they're in Brussels or you know wherever they have to be in order to make that happen. Data centers get built. Things just magically happen with them. We have a total of about 70 researchers, a significant part of uh, uh, an R&D program across Europe with R&D partners. And um, even though <clears throat> these labs are paid out of my budget, um, because uh, my charter is um, I'm the, the, the CTO of our data center and connected uh, solutions group, which is everything but uh, business clients, phones, you know, the, the, the laptops, phones, and tablets. Um, so the HPC charter is under the, uh, the data center group. Um, so Exascale and all the Exascale research and pathfinding, the business side, my collaborator is Raj Hazra, and then I do all the pathfinding and the research. But they're part of the Intel Labs network so that we can leverage the larger Intel lab community, and it's a pretty substantial network. So again, um, it really wasn't the, hey, let's figure out how we can uh, build chips uh, here or build new fabs or anything else. It's inform us of what the applications, the applications that are important for the region, important for your business, and important for Exascale going forward, what's going to happen there, and what we need to do in order to be ready to develop those machines. Give us the feedback. And one of the things I've talked about is, I, you know, um, we don't, we, we had the, uh, it was uh, October, November, it was the first time the labs actually came to the U.S. and started informing uh, the architects for the next generation components um, what their key learnings were. And I want to do more of that, get those engineers over here and certainly get these individuals you know, from the labs over to the U.S. and start spending more time sitting side by side, 
The unfortunate thing is uh, you can never get anything designed by a meeting. You know, when you have a problem, you stand up, and we have cube, little cubicles. I don't know. I think you guys have offices here. That's actually kind of nice. Um, we have cubicles, and if you have something you need, you walk over to somebody else's cubicle, you typically interrupt what they're doing, and you have a hallway conversation. It's amazing how much work gets done with those hallway conversations. Um, if you have a meeting where you've got to collaborate with somebody five, six hours away, that's a great meeting for one or two hours, and then you go about your business. So I think having a lot of these people actually um, coming to the U.S. more frequently is certainly going to be helpful. Um, providing guidance to the applications developers, and then be involved in European and national projects. Um, the only way we're going to be able to get this scale of machine out there is to have uh, the indigenous application development here where people say, uh, hey, I know my codes will run on this particular machine. We help design and develop that machine and architect that machine, whether it's being built by a European OEM, a US OEM, a Chinese OEM, but we know what that machine can do and we want to be able to acquire it and use it for our, to, to do our business. <coughs> so in uh, Flanders, the Exoscience Lab, um, it's uh, in Leuven, and I believe there are five universities plus we're the relationship with IMIC and ourselves. And it's really focusing on the application framework, uh, simulation environment. Um, we have a lot of different simulators. When you do when you do um, a processor, there's a behavioral simulator, a functional simulator, a performance simulator, a power simulator, a cycle packet. We got everyone under the sun. And in some cases, with the sophistication of these machines, there isn't enough computing horsepower to be able to run you know, a lot of these simulations. In fact, we actually have high-performance computing centers that if we wanted to, they would be in the top 500. Okay, and they're just there to support not only back-end validation but simulation. We run these batch jobs, and we have them and strategically around the world, so the sun never sets on a simulation. It can potentially be running in the U.S., in England, or, or somewhere else overseas. So uh, better simulation tools and being able for us to do some quick predictive assumptions on what we need to do to build these machines is important. And then certainly the visualization me methodology. And the big focus is on space weather. And um, I love um, the conversations we have and the review that we, we've had in the last couple of days because the passion of the researcher working on space weather is incredible. And, you know, and then he said, in order to be able to do the kinds of modeling down to the 100 meters of space, because he's trying to model the impact of solar wind on the Earth's magnetic field and how that's going to affect communications and whatnot here, he said, I need to sell 63 billion processors. I got so excited. 63 billion processors is a lot of money. Um, <laughs> but I know that's unrealistic. So he's looking at different modeling paradigms to move that down. Um, so, um, you know, and, and quite honestly, I, it's, it's, I've been very, every time, this is the second big review that Carl's actually, uh, oh, would you stand up, Carl? Just for a bit. Carl Solschenbach is our, uh, li he leads the labs for all our exascale labs um, located in Bitburg. Right. There you go. Where the beer comes from. Where the beer comes from. Yeah, that's how I get over here. Um, so in France, we uh, have the, uh, the exascale computing research center. And most of that is really, really focusing on application scalability and performance tools and looking at tools to be able to understand uh, um, you know, what's happening with the applications so we can model them better. Um, and then we're doing some work in geosciences and some of the nuclear sciences, energy and environment as well. Uh, Barcelona, we just opened Barcelona uh, last October was when we signed the agreement. Um, Mateo Valero is well known in the uh, computing research community. He was one of the winners of the Eckert Mockley Award, I think probably two or three years ago. And the Eckert Mockley Award in the computer science is the equivalent of a Nobel Prize. Uh, I don't think you get as much money, but it's the most exciting thing that you can have happen to you as a computer scientist. And so um, when I sat down with, with uh, Matteo and his team and they showed us the tools they had to be able to model, one of the things we need to understand is if we're going to figure out how to minimize energy, we have to track a bit as it's moving around the machine. And they actually have the tools that will start and the tool infrastructure that allow us to start to be able to do that. And then when I talked about a runtime system where we abstract the machine from the programmer, the capability exists there as well. So very excited about that. And then the ExaCluster lab here with Thomas. And this is looking at cluster level architectures, um, being able to build the scale of machine uh, that, that uh, um, 
that we're going to have to build and what the network is going to look like and how we're going to set up the storage subsystems. And in fact, you know, I, I get excited about the component level because that's really where I grew up. But the system problems are probably the most fundamental problems. And that's why I think Eulish is going to play an extremely important role. Because without having be, being able to be informed on how we're going to put these multiple clusters together and get them to work and work reliably, it's going to be extremely difficult. And we're going to have to have tools at the system level, not necessarily just at the component <coughs> or, the, or the platform level. So as I mentioned, these labs are part of the Intel Lab uh, Europe, uh, you know, the, the portion of what we call ILE Europe. And what that allows them to do is draw on resources from a broader community. Um, the technology and manufacturing group in Ireland, the head there, he has resources that we can potentially put in terms of, you know, maybe someday we can do some prototyping and he can help us out there. Uh, CERN. CERN has been a wonderful partner for us because for years their data center has been a five megawatt data center. Their computing needs have been going up faster than Moore's Law and they keep pushing us maniacally for power efficiency and power efficiency. And so, you know, being able to leverage that broader community for us um, gives us, informs us a lot more about the kinds of things we need to do to build the machines that are going to be real, uh, relevant not only in Europe but all over the world. And um, so in conclusion, our interest is developing an exascale system but at reasonable cost. Like I said, the technologies that we build, my vision is we start waterfalling those down to the mainstream as much as possible. If we can scale memory technology and we can get the power down, Laptops, tablets, phones, whatever the new devices of the future, they can take advantage of that. Um, better battery technology, better um, process technology, greater reliability, better security features. You know, one of the things that concern me is as we start putting more and more sensors out into the field, those are all places that are vulnerable. And then security not necessarily in protecting the information, but keeping some entity from taking advantage of that, using that in order to get into a broader network and a broader infrastructure. Some of the capabilities we'll build in here is certainly something that we can waterfall down. So we see that there is uh, an economic impact. And as an engineer, because the challenges are so hard, it actually, like I said, that is the reason why my career feels better now. And I've had a great career, don't get me wrong, but why I'm more excited now um, than I was before. The unfortunate thing is they don't let me do design anymore. Um, in fact, they don't even let me go in the lab because one time I shut a machine down without shutting down the operating system. So they put a sign, Steve, don't touch this button, and then told me I could never come in again. So I have to do everything from the outside. Power is the challenge. Um, we discussed this yesterday. Uh, you know, I did a calculation for, uh, there's, there's a survey that's going on in the U.S. in terms of what's the energy going to be like for a 50 and a, or 100 megawatt system. And I said, hey, if they located in West Virginia or Idaho, which are the two states in the United States that have the lowest average power on a cost per kilowatt hour, it's going to be 30 to 50 mega, a million U.S. dollars per year just to feed the machines. So power is going to be huge. And that's why the focus starts with power and security first, and then we build everything on top of that. Um, hardware and software must work together. Uh, if you happen to talk to the guys in the lab, they'll say co-design, co-design, co-design. It's actually in the good old days, and I'm going to miss these days, we used to build hardware and give it to the programmers, and they'd say, what's this? And we'd say, stop whining, just you know, figure out how to program it. Um, that's the other way around. Programmers are saying, this is what your machine needs to do. These are the things you need to build, and now it's up to you guys to go build it. So it's an inflection point. And then last but not least, um, we're, number one, I'm really excited about the European labs. Uh, I tend to set my expectations pretty high um, in some things, and my expectations for what we were going to do with the labs um, were pretty high because, quite honest, for me, they're expensive. Uh, they're expensive to run, expensive to maintain, want to make sure that we can get the collaboration. And um, if you ever get a chance and you're interested, ask Carl for his annual report, and I was just blown away by the amount of work that's being done over here and the influence it's already starting to have on our thinking, on our thinking processes. When you know, I have professors that are working that said, hey, I happen to find something in your processor, and I'm talking to the lead architect in this particular, for this particular product, that's the kind of impact you want to have. So that when you look back and you say, hey, here are the exascale systems, you can actually see part of your, your you in these machines. Um, that always worried me about the PC because I really hoped it worked, um, especially when it was part of me and the machine. My biggest fear was um, first board I did, 
little regression here. Uh, was a first first big board that I did was when we came out with a 386, and I did it on Multibus One. And uh, everything was done by hand. In fact, I contend the best design tool God ever created was a pencil. You know, we got these nice big CAD machines, but the pencil was wonderful. And then somebody came in, one of the marketing guys, and said, hey, are you really excited? Your board is in the control system for a nuclear power plant. I got so scared. <laughs> I went home and reevaluated that because I knew there was a bug in there, and if something <laughs> happened, I would get blamed for it. So... Um, but, you know, when there's a part of you and you know, hey, I had a chance to move the world and change the world, it becomes a pretty extraordinary feeling, especially when you walk into a Best Buy and some kid tries to tell you how a PC works and you put your arm around and say, easy, my son, I've been here before and I know exactly how it works. <laughs> um, my wife told me to stop doing that. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I don't know how much time we have left, but if uh, one thing they asked me to do is potentially be available for questions, so is that it? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Th thank you so much, Steve, for this fascinating insight in your thinking. And today, you have the chance to ask questions to a man who really changes the world by decisions and by his thoughts. So take this chance. Now I'm really scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's so. so. Well, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. But when will we have the first access to a computer in the world? Um, that's a good question. Actually, my old boss, who just took a new job, said 2018 is when he wanted to see the systems. Um, now that I've got a new boss, I'm trying to push that out to 2020. Um, and the reason I say that is it's going to take, as I mentioned, it's going to take a lot of new technologies. And essentially, the parts that we're going to be shipping in 2016, they're essentially done in terms of architecture and design. And now it's a matter of getting them ready for productization. So, and the one thing we don't want to do is, is uh, as we say in the U.S., swing for the fences. Put everything in one chip and say, okay, now it's going to come out in 2020 and it's going to work because there will always be a failure if you put too much in. So I'm hoping that it will give us 2018 to start with some of these technologies and the big systems that will be a full exascale will be in the 2020 time frame. And probably in the 20 megawatts. I know you only have a 10 <coughs> megawatt data center, but I'm just giving you a heads up. <laughs> More questions? Okay, hey, uh, let me ask a question. Sure. So in former times, it was clear that the processor have, have, or design has influenced that what we call HPC or supercomputing. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that today it is HPC that is influencing more the processor? I have one good time, I have the, the impression from your talk. Um, so now, the beauty about Intel is, is there can be multiple opinions. Um, so I'll share my opinion, and, and, and we're having this debate inside Intel right now, and there are some people that think, hey, the traditional approach is the right way. I believe that in order to do what we want to do here, the fundamental, the core architecture is going to be completely different than what we have today. Mm -hmm. um, it'll still run x86 code, so we'll have the front end that'll take the instructions and decode them and do what it needs to do, but underneath it'll be completely different, and that's going to be influenced by the workload, not only the workloads, but the power requirements of HPC. Now, whether that underlying core now becomes the basic building block for all our cores going forward, I don't know yet. But I do know for HPC, it's going to be, my belief is it'll be different in 2020 than what we see today. Mm -hmm. And that'll be influenced by a lot of the work that's being done in Europe. So when and if something's wrong, I'm going to blame the guys here. When, here. So, so, so when, when will this process of miniaturization, so we, we are currently at a 22 nanometer process, come to an end? So I, I um, thought it should come soon. Yeah? So at, at least some prophets told us. Ooh, yeah, what the what profits. would you say? Well, yeah, the prophets. So here's my standard answer. I've been told by our process technologists that we will see Moore's Law scaling through 2020 in the sub-10 nanometer range. Now, you know how old I am. I plan on retiring after that, you know, right about that time, so then I tell them whatever happens after that, that's somebody else's problem. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I think the process scaling is going to continue. I don't really see, you know, silicon is so economical, and we have so many fabs around the world. 
People talk about exotic technologies, whether they're organic molecules. I don't see that happening, you know, in the in the near future. I mean, mm -hmm. we'll get some carbon structures, but that'll take some time. Mm -hmm. But I do believe, from an engineering perspective, if we can't grow in the X, you know, you've seen our transistors now, because we were having problems scaling them in the X Y direction. We have actually they're three dimensional devices. We actually grow them in the third dimension in order to be able, and the devices actually look like devices of process technologies too, or three generations ago in terms of their capabilities. So I think that we'll, if we stop doing this, we'll start growing up. My, again, full disclaimer, since this is going on iTunes and more than my mom is probably going to see this, that's just my opinion. That's, <laughs> the views here expressed are my own, not necessarily that of my company or anybody else's. More questions, please. Do you expect to have enough uh, computer scientists around to write, to write the application that will exploit the XSKL systems, or do you propose to put everything under the hood so the traditional programs can use it automatically? Um, well, I would like to put it under the hood so traditional. So to answer your first question, yes, I believe there will be a number of computer scientists because, quite honestly, the kids that come out of school as computer scientists still make really good money, um, even though they can't get a date in college. Uh, you know, I harp on that, but that was a real sensitive time in my life, so just bear with me on that. Um, I, so I think computer scientists will continue to come out. What I want to do, or what I would like to do, is abstract the machine to the point where they don't have to understand the architecture of the machine itself. So when it changes from generation to generation, they have to go either take care of their old code. And we do that today in terms of our compilers and whatnot. We're able to run the old codes. But I think when we talk about the machine, it'll be more than just the processor. The memory controller will be integrated, potentially memory will be on there. The network interface controller will be integrated. It's just the natural progression of things. So I can see where you come to solutions like Java where you have some level of an underlying VM running on top of the machine and the program programs to that abstraction layer, whether that's, you know, whether we call that the instruction set or something else. That's, that's my belief of where we're going to go. And then we'll let the VM manage the machine. Please. And like I said, there's a huge and debate and in Intel. The on that. You have to switch it on yet. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you said we are going in a certain direction. And uh, it's not working. No, it's it working. Is. So we go in the third dimension with the memory, for example, and we have this tower of memory. So how many cores will be around this tower of memory? Well, the beauty is is that you can either stack them on package, so we can still be within the reticle limit of the die. Or if we get really aggressive, we could pack the processor on top of the memory stack. But my belief now is, as we look at it, we'll probably put the memory stacks on package because you can put four or potentially eight stacks. Because um, you'll get high bandwidth, but the capacity won't be what you can get certainly off chip. Okay? And you know the HPC scientists said, look, we'll take as much capacity as you can give us, but boy, if we could get 32 gig or 64 gig, at least two gig per, per core, okay, of, what, of the cores that you have in there, or maybe one gig of really fast memory, we'll partition it accordingly to be able to use it. So, um, my, so my belief is the first instantiations you'll see will probably be on package. And then eventually there'll be processor die that sit on top of there. But I see that as being, that's going to be beyond 2020 in my opinion. Just because <coughs> there's so many technical challenges to get to the point where you stack processor and memory together in high volume manufacturing that I think is still going to be a while. But certainly on package I can see that happening much sooner. So when will we have phase change memory? Well, certain companies are producing phase change memory today. Um, the issue that we'll have, they'll have with phase change memory is that the, uh, they're going to have to come up with something to handle the electric fields as they start to scale beyond the 17 nanometer node as well. The electric fields that have to be produced to create the phase change are going to blow out whatever silicon diode they have, so they're going to have to come up with some structures to be able to compensate for that. But my understanding is um, one of the big memory companies is actually selling PCM phase change mm -hmm. memory today. Mm -hmm. And there are other companies that are doing spin torque transfer memories that are essentially magnetic material that, mm -hmm. um, you know, very fast, um, very efficient. Now, the interesting thing about this, if I may, because you asked, um, we're going back, actually back to the paradigm we had with magnetic core memories. When you turned off the power, your memory image was there when you turned it back on. And when DRAMs came, it all got wiped out. With non-volatile memories, if they actually start taking over more of the memory hierarchy, the software is going to have the opportunity to comprehend the fact that the 
the information is there when they turn the power back on, whether that's your OS image. Now, the danger is that information is probably going to be encrypted. And so you got to keep your keys around, make sure the keys are safe and secure, and that nobody can get in there and actually load a rootkit into the non-volatile memory. So those are going to be some, ch so phase change memory is interesting. I think you'll first start to see it in solid state drives um, to get the cost per bit down, because that'll really drive the volume. And then I think you'll start to see it in, uh, in memory schemes going forward. And if you look on the network, you know, I, I love companies. You can tell when they've done a lot of research and they're not interested because they just flood the the network on, you know, with these kinds of structures, papers on this. So that's where I learn a lot. Wikipedia, <coughs> Wikipedia is one of my favorite sources, even though it's not technically reliable. I learn a lot by it. More questions? Please. Please with, with microphone. Um, no, I think there has to be a lot of work that has to be done. For, for example, um, if you're going to if you're going to have general purpose cores and you need an accelerator in some way, shape, or form, say like our current mic product, you have to go through a driver. Um, so I think what you look for is eventually we take a product like that and we put it under the instruction set model and in the same memory f memory system, so it shares the same virtual address space. And so from the programmer's point of view, it may, the programmer may say go do uh, a Monte Carlo, you know, of, or an FFT of some size. You can either, the, the compiler either instantiate a set of instructions to do it on the general purpose machine, or it'll call a library and move it over to that accelerator and say, give me the result when you're ready. From the programmer, won't know the difference. But it'll, I, I think it'll all be, un I, I'm of a firm belief that we can unify everything under the instruction set. And the I instruction set has so much flexibility going forward, it's got a lot of room to grow. More questions? So let me ask a final question. In Jülich, the, the idea of, uh, let's say, research in memory stores is a very important one, and uh, a big group is uh, uh, concerned with this, with interesting results. Is this also... A, a with memory what? Memory stores. Oh, memristors. Oh. Yes. Is this also something that Intel is interested in? Well, I have to be a little careful. Um, because, um, so yes, we're interested in non-volatile memories that can potentially have the characteristics of memory, like phase change memory. Mm -hmm. Memrister <coughs> falls into a particular class that um, those types of materials may not necessarily have the performance, but they can use a different material and still call it memrister. So what is called memrister? So the way I look at it is Intel <coughs> interested in Non-volatile memory that has the read and write performance of standard memory? Absolutely. Um, are we interested in, you know, non so, but And it has to have that in order to start thinking about, okay, well, how do we change the memory hierarchy, assuming DRAM can't scale like we've seen it scale before? If it comes out and has the same characteristics as NAND, it'll never be a re memory replacement technology. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we're interested, but it depends on what that material looks like. I guess there are no more questions. All right. Thank you very much. And um, I hope I don't get in trouble by being on iTunes, i got to tell you. Okay. Let's thank <laughs> you again. About that. Thank you very much.